any bias uh, towards this side and this side because I see most of the people are sitting this side and not this side. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand it's difficult, especially considering the climate today. So, anyway, but anyway, I'll start because I had to finish by 10 because otherwise the next speaker will just, uh, I don't know. Uh, so, my name is Anirban and uh, till last month I was a part of this department and I just graduated, I completed my master's here. And currently I'm working with Amazon as an applied scientist. Uh, so during my master's, I was working with Professor Narshima Murthy. I was working broadly in the area of machine learning, but to be more specific, I was working in the representation learning for graphs, especially uh, uh, information networks and social networks. So I'm also a volunteer uh, of the summer school. Probably you have not seen me because I was a little bit busy with my work, um, but you can see my t-shirt, right? So, and that proves that I'm a volunteer. And uh, so, okay, so let me take this opportunity to welcome you again uh, to summer school. And I hope you are enjoying the summer school, right? Uh, so how is the food? Is it good? Excellent. Okay, great. And mm -hmm. okay. And uh, uh, how, how was the talks uh, uh, you enjoyed? Okay. And uh, what about the prank? <laughs> okay, fantastic. Okay, so today I'll be. Uh, so you, you can see the topic of the talk is uh, words don't lie. So initially when I was thinking about uh, uh, preparing this topic, uh, uh, that's the catch line that I, I could think of. But uh, and initially my plan was a little bit dif different. I, I thought that I'd present both uh, the sequence model as well as uh, the word embeddings and uh, some state of the art word embedding technique. But uh, you know, due to the time constraint, I just cut it down only to sequence model. So that's why. Uh, I changed the title a little bit, so it's now sequences don't lie. So today we'll be talking about uh, uh, sequence models and mostly uh, the, the re recurrent neural networks and all. So how many of you are uh, familiar with uh, the neural network, the standard neural network? Okay, 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 fine. So I mean, I don't think it will be very difficult to catch up what I'll be talking about, but. Uh, if you feel at any point of time you have any question, you're not able to understand something, uh, just uh, feel free to ask me. Because uh, you know the, the primary reason or primary goal of this talk not to finish what I have prepared, but at least uh, to talk something which you can understand and uh, so that you can go back and you can uh, start working, start researching about these topics. So, so I'll be speaking of uh, some of the applications of a sequence model. That's what I will start with because I think uh, the applications are really, really important because uh, you know this application that will give you a feel that what kind of problems people are working recently and uh, on sequence model on recurrent neural networks. And uh, probably when you go back to your respective universities, you'll, you'll start working, start researching on those on those topics. Okay, so let's get started. So here's the first application I can think of, which is a speech recognition. So here, uh, the uh, input is an audio clip. And uh, uh, the task is to map the audio clip to a text transcript Y. So uh, I think all of you are familiar with uh, uh, the, the subtitles that you get uh, in English movies, right? So those kind of applications uh, are related to speech recognition. So in this case, both the input and the output are uh, sequence data. and and uh, the, by sequence data, I mean that here the audio clip that plays out over the time, right? And also the uh, the output, which is a transcript, is nothing but a sequence of words. So the next application is, uh, is sentiment analysis. So nowadays, a lot of people have been working on this particular topic, and uh, recently it has gained a lot of uh, momentum. So here also the input is, uh, say, a movie review, which is uh, again a sequence of words. And the output will, might be the uh, the rating for the review. So I'll be giving one example, but before that, I'd uh, I want to tell you that uh, you know in in this entire talk, I'll be giving you many many examples, and most of the examples have reference to two of my favorite books and movie series, uh, uh, which is uh, one is Game of Thrones and other is uh, Harry Potter. So how many of you here are Game of Thrones fans? Okay, and Harry Potter. Good, good. So uh, 
Okay, so before I go into that, so I want to share you one thing, right? Uh, so I was a teaching assistant in uh, one of the courses, linear algebra. And there I had to design two assignments. And one of the assignment was on uh, Game of Thrones, other was on uh, uh, Harry Potter. So any, any of you are interested in GOT or Harry Potter and also linear algebra, you just send me a mail, I can share the assignments with you and probably you'll enjoy that. Okay, so let's get back to uh, what we were. So say you are given this input phrase that the final season of Game of Thrones was pretty bad. So in fact, it was horrible. Uh, so, uh, so the output that, or the question is how many stars or uh, what kind of smiley you will give uh, uh, or you think will be most appropriate for this kind of uh, review. So this is what sentiment analysis is all about. This is another interesting application for sequence model, which is uh, music generation. So here, uh, the output Y is the sequence or the music, which is a series of, say, your music notes. And the input can be an empty set, or it might be an integer, which corresponds to the genre of the music you want to listen. Or it might be uh, the first few notes of the piece of music you want. So it might seem a little bit mind boggling that how can from an empty set you can generate uh, the sequence uh, of notes. So uh, we'll see uh, in, in, in one of the slides that it is indeed possible. And that is, that is very, very interesting. So DNA sequence is, sequencing is another interesting application for sequence models. So say your DNA uh, is represented by these four uh, characters, A, C, G, and T. And given this kind of sequence, what our aim is to find the where in the sequence uh, your protein uh, starts and where in the sequence it ends. So essentially, we want to find that uh, in which part of the sequence corresponds to the protein. So this one, I think all of you are familiar with, right? So I think every day we use uh, Google Translate. So I use Google Translate a lot of times because uh, my English vocabulary is, is pretty uh, weak and uh, Whenever I find a word I don't understand. So I'm a Bengali, so I just translate it to Bengali. I use Google Translate. So, uh, so the machine translator, translation is the, is the technical term for this translation. And here, you know, the, you want, uh, you give an input sentence, maybe in one of the language, say English, and you want to translate it to say another language, maybe say Spanish. So for example, say the English sentence is say the Tyrion Lannister is an awesome actor. And you want to translate it to the Spanish version, which is Trillian Lenista is un hectare increíble. So this is kind of application a lot of people are working nowadays. And one interesting part about this application, you see that uh, the, the length of the sequence here, the length of the input sequence might not be same as the length of the output sequence. So it might be very, very different depending on the which language you want to translate to. So in video activity recognition, you're given a sequence of say video frames and what you want, you want to find the activity in the video. So maybe somebody is uh, walking or somebody is running and you want to pinpoint that what kind of activity the person is doing. Just giving and just looking at the sequence of the videos. This is very interesting application. So uh, this is called automatic program repair. So you know nowadays, I mean, since probably three, four years back, people are only using the traditional uh, software engineering technique to find the, to detect the bugs in a program or maybe correct the program automatically. But recently, uh, it has gained a lot of traction and uh, people are trying machine learning techniques to solve the bug detection problem or program correction problem. So I took one of the course uh, in, in our department, which is called software engineering with uh, uh, machine learning where we are given this kind of task that uh, you are given an incorrect code snippet and you have to use machine learning technique to correct that program. So which is very, very different from the traditional uh, software engineering techniques. And uh, uh, the primary reason where this is going to be a very, very interesting because you know nowadays you have a lot of code available in GitHub, publicly available code in any of the language you take. and uh, the language, uh, the, the, the particular language, say Python or Java, it has a very nice structure in it. And which kind of helps because uh, in natural languages, there is no structure. But in code, there's a very nice structure. And that, those structure is actually leveraged to, to solve this problem. 
So here you can see that uh, the incorrect program does not have this ending press where the correct program uh, so the, the, uh, it will automatically collect the, correct the program by including this brace here. So again it's a sequence of data. So the last one is uh, named entity recognition where uh, so you are given a sentence or a paragraph and you want to identify the name of say uh, people's name or maybe city and date. So for example here the sentence is get me a flight from New York City to San Francisco for next Thursday. And uh, what do you want? You want to find out the uh, source city, the destination city and the departure date. So, uh, so this sentence again uh, uh, the input is a sequence of words. The output should be say uh, the departing city or the destination city and the maybe the departure date. So uh, what is a common theme? So as I already mentioned that uh, all of this application that deals with sequences and words. So, uh, so you can think of this problem that can be uh, addressed as supervised learning with level data X and Y as a, as a training set. And uh, you know there are a lot of different types of uh, sequence problems as I already mentioned because uh, in some of the cases you see that both the input and the output both are sequences. For example in machine translation the input is a sequence, the output is also a sequence but the length of the sequences might be different whereas in case of named entity recognition even if both are sequences but the, the length of the sequences are same. In some of the cases uh, the, either the input or the output is a sequence. So for example in music generation only the output is a sequence but not the input whereas in uh, sentiment uh, analysis or sentiment classification the input is a sequence which is the movie review but the output is just the rating. So there are different kinds of variation possible for uh, this sequence model but the underlying theme is exactly same. Uh, it's, it's kind of it's trying to solve the sequence problem. And it's one of the most exciting areas in deep learning and you know uh, the models like recurrent neural networks or RNNs, those are very very useful to solve this particular problem. Though you'll see that the, the standard neural networks that are not so good solving this kind of problem, and that's why this rec recurrent neural network, which is a variation of the standard neural network, it, it it tries to solve this kind of problems. Okay, so till this point everything is clear. Any question? So I'll share the slides with you. Think about this uh, uh, again. Go and uh, look about this uh, all these applications. And if you find interest in any of the applications, you know uh, all these applications. Uh, these are very very uh, recent uh, applications, and a uh, lot of people around the globe, a lot, lot of researchers around the globe are working in in all these applications. Okay. So we'll see one motivating example for this. So say uh, uh, this is this is an excerpt from uh, the Harry Potter, the first book of Harry Potter, first chapter. Yeah. So Harry Potter and Sorcerer's Stone, or Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. So what our aim is that given this uh, set of sentences, we want to find the name and the place which is there in this in the entire excerpt. So you can see that these blue, uh, orange colored boxes, right? It corresponds to the names, where well, Harry or Mrs. Dursley or Dudley, and uh, this blue colored this corresponds to a place, which is a private drive. And what do you want? Given this set of sentences, we want to find that where these names and places are occurring. So and uh, so the input is this. Output will be one when we find an uh, a name. Or place, and it will be zero when we when it's not a name or a place. So when the in, uh, input is good, it will be zero corresponding output. Whereas when it will be when it is Harry, it will be one. So that's the entire setup of this problem. So given this, uh, you you uh, so you know this is again this named entity recognition problem, and this is just one variation. Named entity recognition, it's a very broad uh, category. They, it may not be only restricted to name or place. It may be some city, uh, as I already mentioned, or maybe some uh, some other thing. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so there are a lot of applications of uh, NER. 
So uh, especially in search engines, you know, the, uh, what they do is say uh, a search engine has a lot of data, right? So it takes all the news data for say last 24 hours, and it want to it want to uh, index the uh, the name of uh, somebody which is occurring. So based on the frequency, uh, it's occurring. So say uh, um, Donald Trump. So the, not the name of the Donald Trump is occurring say 100 times, or say Narendra Modi is occurring. 20 times. So you want to index based on the frequency of the names it's occurring in the last 24 hours of news data. This is one application of uh, in here. So before going into the details of recurrent network, I'll take a small detour and uh, and we'll see uh, how we can represent the words. So you know, uh, words are most important part of uh, any natural language processing system. And uh, our computers, they don't understand sequences, they don't understand one. The only thing they understand is, uh, is uh, numbers. So what do we want? We want to represent these uh, words into an appropriate format. Uh, so, you so given this uh, kind of uh, sentences, you have your training data and you have your all the words in your training data. So first thing you want, you want to come up with a vocabulary. So what are the words appearing in your vocabulary? Or sometimes it's also called a dictionary, which is essentially your list of words. And uh, so one way to build this dictionary is just you go through your training data, you find out the word, the what are the words that are appearing, and say you take the top say 10,000. Based on your application, then this number might change. So say you take top 10,000 words, and that will be your final vocabulary. Now. And many of the commercial NLP applications, it has uh, around 30,000 to 50,000. Sometimes it go to 100,000. But if you consider large internet companies, there the uh, the vocabulary size is pretty huge. It's it ranges from millions to sometimes it goes to billions. So in those cases, it's a little bit complicated because of the huge uh, vocabulary size. But for our purpose, we'll only stick to say we have 10,000 words vocabulary. And say the, the vocabulary contains these words, uh, Albus, then a little bit down you find Harry, a little bit down uh, you find uh, Snape, and then finally say the last word of your vocabulary is Potion. And say it's a 10,000 word vocabulary. And uh, what we'll be using, we'll be using something called one hot representation to represent each of these words. I'll use the board and I'll, I'll explain how, how this works. So let's say, uh, Let's consider three words. Let's say Harry, which say appears. Say, so, so you remember that 10,000 is our vocabulary size. Is it visible? The font? Okay. So, say Harry, Harry appears say, at the position 4051 in your vocabulary. Say Ron appears. 7083 and let's take portion which is a 10,000 position. So what we'll do, we'll represent this using a 10,000 length vector. So say this is our 10,000 length vector. So one, so this is 4051 position. This is a 7083. And down the line, say so this is 10,000. And the way we we'll represent Harry is that the 4051 position will put a 1, and rest of the positions will put 0. So all these are 0 down. In Ron, what we'll do? So in 7083 position, we'll put a 1, and again, rest of the positions will put 0. And similarly for portion as well. So all are zero, except the 10,000 position will have one. So this is how the one hot representation works. So it's called one hot because there is exactly one one in the entire uh, set of numbers, and all the rest of the numbers will be zero. It's clear, right? Okay. So uh, one last important detail about this slide is uh, what if you encounter a word which is not in your vocabulary? So sometimes it happens that uh, in, uh, in in your standard machine learning problems, right? You have your training data, you have your test data. 
and maybe uh, one of the words in your test data was not there in your training data so so that word is obviously not in your vocabulary because you created your vocabulary based on your training data so how do you handle those situation so to solve this so to solve this you you create one fake token which is corresponds to the unknown word let's say this call it as unk and uh, you include that token to your vocabulary so the, your vocabulary size becomes one more so it becomes 10001 now and say so this is your 10001 position and what do you do you add a zero here zero here zero here and for this unk token you just again do the same one or representation only at the 10001 position you put a one and whenever you find some word which is not in your vocabulary you just replace that word with this token so that's how you handle the uh, the word which is not in your vocabulary okay so i hope this is clear at this point right so let's say so i'll start with an another example so can i erase this So let's say we have an example sentence like this Harry lived with the Dursleys. Okay. So this is our uh, example sentence. And let's consider that all of these words are very in your vocabulary. So for all of these words, we have these one hundred representations. So all of these words, we have this one word representation, and the task is again the same: find the name uh, in in this word, uh, in this sentence. So for Harry, we'll have output one. Lived with and the, it will have output zero, and for Dashless, it will it is the output should be one because both are names. Let's say. So the setup is clear, okay? Uh, so let's say we want to solve this problem. Using the standard neural network, so so the, the the goal is given the representation for x. So x means uh, we have all the words, and x is the representation for each of the words. And given this representation, we want to use a neural model to map the target to the output y, where outputs are one zero 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 one. And uh, so what we'll do, we'll feed these word vectors. So these are our word vectors. So this is say our x1, this is x2, till say this is one, two, three, four, five. These are our word vectors, and these are our outputs y1 to y5. And what we'll do? We'll use a standard neural network, and we'll feed the input vectors one by one, and the corresponding outputs we have y1. So that's how we want to train the neural network. So neural network is nothing but a you can think of it as a function approximator where you have some input, you just give the input to the neural network. Maybe with so these are this is called a hidden layer, and these are the neurons. So each neurons performs some sort of algebraic operation, and then finally you have the output layer. So what do you want? You want the output to be similar to the output. So in case of Harry, the output should be similar to one. In case of Lived, output should be almost equal to zero. That's what you want. So, and finally, you have you do the forward propagation. You do some sort of algebraic application in all of these neurons, and then again you go back, which is called back propagation, and finally you update the parameters. So parameters are what that governs the entire neural network. So, uh, yeah. So let's say you give uh, you feed these uh, word vectors into your neural network. So here, this is the word vector. So x. This is a ten thousand uh, uh, length vector, right? So here it will be x one to x ten thousand, and output is zero or one. 
in this particular example. And so uh, you feed for uh, you feed the word vectors into a new neural network. Maybe you use you can use some uh, uh, hidden layers, and then eventually the output will tell whether the word is a name or not. Now, essentially, there are two problems associated with the standard neural network. The first one is, you know, uh, in case of sequence model, as I already mentioned, that the input length, the length of the input sequence and the length of the output sequence might not be same. So, in one of the examples, say the length is say, five. If I take another example, the length of the input might be say ten. So that's a problem with the standard neural networks. But this is not a so serious problem, and you can solve this problem using a taking a maximum length of your uh, sentence and then you pad zeros so if a uh, sentence is say, length 10 and another sentence is length 5 so you you consider that 10 length sentence as your maximum length and whatever for the 5 length sentence you put five zeros and then you make it as 10 so that's how you solve you pad zeros and then you solve the problem of the different length uh, but uh, there is a second problem which is even more serious uh, which is this uh, the standard or naive neural network architecture it doesn't share feature learned across different uh, positions of the text so what do you, what do we mean by that so for example the harry this word it comes at the first first position of your sentence right and uh, say your neural network understands okay this is a name but say Harry in some of the sentence, Harry might come at the end. So wouldn't it be nice if your neural network automatically understands, okay, this the word is Harry, it doesn't matter which part of the sentence is coming, but I should uh, uh, find that or I should detect that it's a name. So this kind of thing is not possible using standard neural network. So it does not, because it does not share the, uh, the weights across the different time steps. So is this clear or I mean it's little bit difficult to understand the first go but uh, I think if you go back and you just uh, see this one more time I think it will be much more clear so these are two primary problems of uh, standard neural network uh, especially in case of sequence data so the way we try to solve this we use recurrent neural network so and this is where the RNN kicks in it tries to solve both the problems and it solves both both the problems very very efficiently so here is what uh, the recurrent neural network is so what it does it scans the uh, data from left to right one by one so i'll i'll explain uh, i'll try, i will uh, build this one uh, neural uh, rnn but uh, the, the second problem that i mentioned right the parameters are not shared across the different time steps so that problem is solved using RNN. So let's see how it solves. So say for this first word, you create one uh, neural network layer. Maybe you just say one hidden layer. So this is one neural network layer. You feed the vector x1 here. It does some calculations uh, because you say this is a neural network. It does some calculations here. It creates some activation functions and then uh, it tries to predict and it predicts some value say y1 hat and what do you want this y1 hat should be close to y1 that's what we want now when the second word comes in so in standard neural network you just feed the second word again and then you try to predict y hat 2 but instead of RNNs what you do you again create a neural network layer you feed the vector x2 here but here not only the x2 is the input but also you take the output of the activation function from the first layer and you feed it to the next layer so say the activation is here say a1 so in some sense it's not only taking uh, this word lived but also it's getting some input from the previous values now and then it tries to predict y hat 2 now the next, for the next word width, what do you do? You again create this layer and you connect it uh, to A2. 
the previous time step and this is the x3 and finally your output y hat 3 so y hat 3 in some sense it's considering both x1 and x2 while predicting y hat 3 now it's not only considering x3 but also x1 and x2 because this activation function a2 is a combination of some nonlinear functions of x1 and x2 and finally say you go to the last time step which is say x I am considering as tx and say so this is your y hat tx. So although in this case I am considering both the input and output output sequence lengths are same but uh, there are different kind of ar architectures we will see in short that uh, this tx and ytx might not be same the lengths might be different. So this is how, how the recurrent uh, neural networks are built you have for all the time steps you create a set of neural networks and you connect it one by one so this is a this is called an unfold version of the neural uh, recurrent neural network so the the, sh the shorter version looks like this it's kind of this and you feed it back uh, again so this is the unfold version it's, it's much easier to understand the unfolded version and to kick off the whole thing what do you do you just uh, give a activation a0 to the first uh, uh, first layer or the first time step and usually this a0 is considered to be all zero vectors but people have tried with random vectors as well so uh, so this is not, not so important but just to kick off the whole thing and when you'll be implementing it uh, uh, in code then you need, you need this a0 so that's what a uh, uh, recurrent neural network looks like and uh, as i mentioned that it solves both the problems so like uh, the length problem as well as the uh, f uh, sh sharing features problem because because uh, here say so the parameters are uh, w and for all the time steps you use the same set of parameters w okay So I mentioned here that the horizontal connections uh, connections will be governed by some set of parameters W A A, and uh, the vertical connections are where you are predicting the output. So, so the vertical connections means this connection. So these are W Y A, governed for all these are these are W Y A, and the, for the vertical connection the parameters are say W A A. So these are same across all the time steps. So although the uh, re recurrent neural network it solves uh, the problem of uh, the standard ne neural network, but it comes with its own set of problems. So let's have a look at these its problems. So one weakness of the recurrent neural network is that it considers information from, from only the earlier part of the sentence. Because uh, say when you are trying to predict the output corresponding to the input width, you are only seeing Harry and lived. But uh, don't you think that it would be good if I, if we know also the what is coming on the later part of the sequence as well? So, so just to give uh, to motivate you, let's say we have this uh, uh, sentence. He said Morgan Freeman is a brilliant actor. Now again, you want to find the name inside it. So Morgan is is a name, right? So, but if you go from left to right, so the sentence might be like this also. He said, Morgan Stanley is a great organization. So in the first sentence, although the Morgan is a name, but in the second sentence, it's not a name, it's the name of an organization. But if you look only from left to right, or if you scan the data from left to right, so till the point when you come to Morgan, you have only see, seen two words, he and said, right? So there is no way to differentiate between these two sentences. Although the first sentence, there's a name, second, second sentence, this is not a name. But if you look the second part of the sentence, which is Freeman is a brilliant actor and Stan is a, a great organization, that gives a very nice hint that, okay, fine, that second sentence is probably not a name, but his first sentence is a name. So this kind of problem, uh, it's there in the standard record in neural network. And the way people have solved this problem is using these uh, bidirectional neural networks or BRNN, where you not only consider or scan the data from left to right, but you also consider the data from right to left. 
So for example, uh, while predicting the value for width, you consider Harry and Liv, and also you consider the and Dursley's. So the way it's done, it's you uh, do uh, you again for each of these layers, you create another neural network, and you feed this data here, here, and also you uh, do this thing. You back propagate it from right to left. So first thing, it's left to right. Second part, it's right to left. So this is called bidirectional neural network, and this is used to solve this kind of problem. But do you see that what, what might be the issue with uh, BRNNs? What kind of problems that BRNNs uh, can face? Any idea? <laughs> it might not make any sense in some of the cases, but you know the, the example I give, right? It makes sense. Right to left. In, in some of the sentences, it might not make sense, but in many cases, it might make sense. Why? No, no, no. So from left to right, you, you speak, right? So this is your sentence. This is the word. So left to right, there are two words. And right to left, there are two words. So there is no chance of having infinite change. It's not like you are going like this and then again coming back. It's not like this. You fix the position of the word. You see what are the words that are before that, and then you see the what are the words that are after that. In in BRN, you consider both. You consider both from left to right. I mean, from front to back, and again from uh, back to front. No, no, no. So the way it's done, it's you connect this network. So say for when you want to predict y1, you just do this thing. You take x1, uh, uh, the output of this network, like this, and then the output of this network, which is the backward direction, which is coming from all the way from right to left. And then you kind of combine these two. And then this combination is again given some uh, nonlinearity. And then finally, you predict y1. So the problem is uh, for natural language processing problems where you have the entire data beforehand, you can do this thing because uh, while, uh, while using BRNN, you can see that you want the entire sentence, right? But say consider the case of speech recognition where you want to predict the data as soon as you hear something. So if you say, say if you tell a sentence or you, if you say a sentence, then uh, say you say this till this point, Harry lived with. So till this point, you, you don't have any idea what is coming after this. And you want to predict the uh, output corresponding to the width at that point. So in those cases, BRNNs cannot solve this problem because you don't know what is coming uh, before uh, after this. So those kind of situations uh, in speech recognition, BRNN doesn't work. OK. So let's try to see uh, how the training for the, uh, the neural network, the recurrent neural network works. So I'll remove this part. So for any neural network, uh, the training part, there are three steps. One is the first one is the forward propagation. The next step is calculating the loss. And the final step is uh, back propagating the loss and update the parameters. Now, uh, it turns out that the first two steps, steps are uh, easy and straightforward. It's, it's just a series of matrix multiplications and algebraic uh, uh, manipulations. But the third part is hard, which is the back propagation. And uh, so, uh, for, the, for this kind of neural network, right? What do you do in case of forward propagation? You calculate uh, the activation A1 based on uh, this WA and A0 and X1. You then again, based on X1, you calculate the uh, activation A2 and finally till TX. And to predict the output, you use these parameters WYA and you predict Y1 hat, Y2 hat till YT hex hat. 
Now, what do you do to calculate the loss for each of these steps? You create a, a loss function or you create a loss. So, say for uh, y1 hat, the loss is say l1. So, this is the l1 for this the loss. For y2, we have the loss say l2. Similarly, for y3, we have l3 down the line till ytx we will have say ltx so this is the individual loss for each of the uh, the unit of the recurrent neural network and finally what you do you sum all these loss values and you get your final loss value so so this is your final loss value so this is your capital l which is capital is the summation of of li where i goes from 1 to tx right so it's like this you connect this you connect this this and this so this is your final loss you sum up all the individual loss and then you get your total loss now the back propagation is exactly the opposite way so you start from this and you go back go back go back till this point so the way it is done is so you have your loss function you calculate the the derivative of the loss with respect to your parameters and then you so for this part right for this arrow i am creating a backward side arrow so this give you a loss or uh, the derivative of the loss corresponding to this this particular loss function similarly for l3 for l2 and for l1 and that's how you back propagate your loss and then you do the do, do this thing ultimately what you want you want to update this w right and w is are update basically say so at time step t plus 1 this will be at time step t minus gradient of your loss function which is with respect to w so you 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 do this thing you again back propagate it like this like this like this and similarly you have this backward directions as well so finally and finally you get uh, uh, the uh, the weight update for each of these uh, uh, each of these units so that's how uh, the back propagation works so i would suggest you to uh, implement the recurrent neural network uh, from scratch implement the forward propagation part implement the loss function part and then you can implement the backward propagation part because unless you do that it's i mean probably you'll understand it but if you do it if you if you do hands on then it becomes much much easier to understand so go back and then try to implement the small part maybe you take three units and implement that so the ent entire picture will be much much clear then so that's how this is uh, a back propagation for uh, uh, recurrent neural network works okay i have 20 minutes of time i think so let's have a look at the different types of rnn that are there so so as i already mentioned that the uh, depending on the input and output lengths uh, uh, you can use different kind of rnn architectures so the first one is one to one which is uh, similar to the standard neural network architecture and this is used maybe uh, uh, some binary classification problems say let's say you have a a set of images of cats and dogs and you want to identify or given a image you want to you want to identify whether it's a cat image or it's a dog image so it is essentially a binary classification problem and for those kind of problem this is most suitable the one to one architecture now one to many is uh, suitable for the problems we mentioned right music generation where you have a uh, uh, only one uh, input which is say, the genre of the music and then you have the sequence of data which is the the output is the sequence which is your music notes sentiment classification you can use many to one because here the input is a sequence and output is a number many to many architecture has two variations the first one where you have the input length and output length the same the next one is where the, those are different so this is useful for any air application and the the other one which is useful for machine translation where you have different uh, lens for input and output data and this kind of architecture it's called uh, encoder decoder ar architecture and the reason is uh, the first part till this part it tries to encode the data encode your input data 
and then finally the the other part which is called the decoder part it tries to decode your data based on uh, based on your training data okay okay so let's move on to uh, one of the interesting area of uh, nlp uh, which is called uh, language modeling so this is one of the most basic and important task in uh, NLP and uh, the sequence models like RNNs, those are very, very useful for uh, language modeling. So we'll try to understand it uh, through some examples. So let's say uh, I say the apple and pear salad is, was delicious. Now when I say that, so uh, this is your uh, uh, speech recognition system. So you say it's Amazon Alexa. So when it hears what I said, it might think that I'm, I have said the apple and pear salad or the apple and pear salad because the, 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 it sounds almost similar, right? And a good uh, speech recognition system should be able to identify the correct one. So in this case, the first one is correct one, whereas the second one is not correct. So, and the way it does, the uh, speech recognition system does, it's through something called language modeling. So what language modeling does, it associates a probability value with each of this sentence. So for example, here, let's say for the first sentence, I associate some value, probability value. And for the second sentence also, I associate some probability value. And ideally the probability value for the first sentence should be higher than the second sentence because it's correct. So let's say the probability value for the first sentence is say 3.2 10 to the power minus 2 whereas the probability value for the second sentence say 4.5 times 10 to the power minus 5. So you see that uh, the probability value for the first sentence is 10 to the power 3 times higher than the probability value of the second sentence and this is basically done by this language models. So as I already mentioned it tells the probability of the sentences and helps to pick the most likely one. Another example might be this uh, uh, tra machine translation where say, let's say you have, you want to translate this Spanish sentence to English. And uh, the Spanish sentence says, Arias Turk viene a Invernalia, which means that Arias Turk comes to Winterfell. And uh, the, say, let's say we have another translation which says Arya Stark will come to Inter Winterfell. Now we have to find out that which translation is more appropriate. And uh, again, it's the same way, the language model, it calculates the probability of the first translation, it calculates the probability of the second translation, and which one is giving higher value, it picks that one. So that's the way language model works. So sequence generation is something uh, that is used by language models and uh, uh, you, you can generate a sequence uh, uh, or say se sequence of words uh, without even giving any input. Uh, as I already mentioned in case of uh, music generation that you are not giving anything but still you are generating some text. So, so first you want to, what do you want? You want to train so again, you are using this uh, RNN set of RNNs to train your model, but the way it's it's trained, it's a little bit different from the usual thing that I mentioned. So here, you see that uh, instead of x1, x2, x3, I'm writing it as x1, then y1, y2. So let's say for this sentence, I consider these words as, uh, say this is y1, this is y2, this is y3, y4, and y5. And I give this input to this neural network. So x1, what I'll do during training, I set the x1 to be all zero vectors. And then given this zero vector to the first neural network, it will try to predict something y1 hat. So, and ideally for this sentence, what I want, I want y, y1 hat to be Harry, right? So, uh, and then again, you calculate the loss functions. For the next time step, 
you will get the input y1 which is harry so what it tries to do it tries to predict the next word given the current word so when i give harry as input the next word should be lived right so the y1 y2 hat should be closer to the representation of lived and similarly until the end now sometimes in 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 this kind of scenarios you again add a end of sentence token just to ensure that your because let's say just to ensure that your sentence ends here so whenever you find us token you can understand okay this is the end of my sentence i can now go go to the next sentence so when i input I give dash list as the input let's say here then ideally what it should produce it should produce us token right there and then you understand okay my first sentence is finished i'll move to second sentence so this is how the training part is done for the uh, sequence generation to actually generate the sequences or sample the novel sequences the way it's done so once you give the the first input is again same you say let's say you give all zero vectors and say uh, it predicts something say it predicts a vector of length 10000 and you will find that which which vector is more appropriate so say if you have 10000 word vocabulary and each point in the uh, or each number in that uh, 10000 word output is y1 hat it gives the probability of uh, of occurring that particular word so you randomly sample one word that is that say let's say that is your first word in your generated sequence and uh, then you input that word that output to the second uh, second time step so if it's harry it's predicting harry then you give harry to the next time step and then again it will predict something let's say it predicts lived and then that word is again fed into the next time step so that's why you generate the uh, sequence and uh, the reason the us is introduced is just to ensure that uh, so you have to stop your gen sentence generation at some point of time right and how do you understand that okay this is the point i should stop this is exactly where us token comes in and but in some cases it is also uh, possible that you don't have us token in your vocabulary then you might consider that okay depending on your application you think that okay after 20 words i'll stop so you generate a 20 words and then you stop so till this point uh, uh, whatever i have talked about is only generation of words but and also these are called word level language model because you are generating words and also as the input you are giving words there is another variation which is growing popular more and more which is called character level language model where instead of giving a word as input what do you do you give character as your input so first layer you just give h next you give a next you give r like this so instead of giving a word you just give a, a character as input so there are pros and cons of this character level language model over uh, uh, the word level language model so the advantage is that in word level language model you have to deal with the unknown tokens but in character level language model your set of characters are fixed right you say uh, the alphabets and then say you include 0 to 9 and say some punctuations so that's all your uh, that's that's the your entire vocabulary and it's very unlikely that whatever comes in it's outside your vocabulary so uh, this is one advantage of character level language model you don't have to deal with uh, the unknown words but there are issues or the uh, there are disadvantages of character level language model which is uh, you end up with much longer sequences because uh, i mean normally or typically uh, english sentence might contain say 10 to 15 words but when you uh when you use uh, characters right it's a uh, dozens of characters which which is quite huge and the problem is that it creates a something called uh, long term dependency so and uh, it's seen that the the word level language model is is much better in capturing long term dependencies than the uh, character level language model and also as a sequence length grow, gr grows big it's uh, more computationally expensive to train but nowadays uh, the computers are getting faster and faster so people have tried looking into character level language model at least in some specific applications 
so here is the uh, something uh, which is generated using a character level language model so a particular uh, sequence model or neural network is uh, trained using a news data so you have a huge set of uh, huge corpus of news data and you, you you train your model using your news data and then you try to generate uh, a, a text based on the uh, the train model so here is how it looks like so although it's pretty vague and uh, i mean there are grammatical mistakes but if you consider the sentence like conclusion epidemic to be examined it somehow it looks like it's a it's kind of coming out from a newspaper the other part the right hand side it's a uh, the, the model was trained using a shakespearean text so whatever uh, uh, was written by shakespeare the entire uh, set of uh, books or texts has been fed into the neural network and then it generates this kind of uh, uh, sentence and so for example for whose are rules of my nice heaps it seems that it is written by shakespeare only so this this is something uh, what people are looking into currently and uh, interesting applications for the sequence generation can be uh, let's say uh, you know the, the nowadays uh, the, the the websites like creek buzz they are generating the uh, commentary and the way it's generated now it's somebody is sitting there watching the match and then after each ball is writing the commentary but if you can build some neural network or the sequence model where it will just have a look at the sequence of images or will have the watch the match and then it will analyze the things and automatically come up with the commentary so in those places sequence generation will be um, might be very very useful and also in case of movie reviews also say let's say you feed the entire movie to a neural network and it generates a review for the movie so this is uh, what sequence generation does okay so uh, i already mentioned one of the problems in uh, neural network was this uh, uh, that uh, it only scans through left to right and it was solved and the problem was solved using brnn or bidirectional rnn there are a couple of more issues uh, 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 there in uh, recurrent neural networks and uh, to solve these issues there are two variants of neural networks are introduced one is called gru or gated recurrent unit and the other is called lstm or long short term memory we'll see those uh, uh, in, in short but uh, let's have a look at the problems uh, that are there in neural network uh, in rnns so first one is called vanishing gradient problem so let's consider this example of white worker which had pale blue blood and bones like milk glass pale and shiny eyes deeper and bluer than any human eyes dot 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 was vulnerable to weapons made of dragon glass now if you see the highlighted part of the text where well, white worker it's a singular noun and the and because of the singular noun the verb is was whereas in the second sentence if it's a plural then it will be were right and you can see the there is a huge gap between the uh, white worker and was and this is called long term dependencies and usually in english words you will find in many many instances where this long term dependency is prevalent and because of this long term dependency there is a uh, uh, which rnns are very bad at capturing and uh, that's where the vanishing gradient problem comes in so i'll go to the next so if you look at this uh, neural network it's, let's say it's a very deep neural network say let's say it's a hundreds of layers are there between the output and input now what you do in case of back propagation you back propagate the loss from here till the point here now the way the loss works is uh, let's say for this kind of network so there are hundreds of layer so this is say l100 this is l50 and this is l1 now you only you update the uh, weight vector here based on the loss coming from here so essentially that means what you do you calculate this thing gradient of this with respect to w and del l1 del w as 
some function of multiplied by del l2 del l w till del l50 del l w till del l100 now let's say uh, these values this del l100 to del l2 del l50 all these are less than 1 and you are multiplying all these values and if you are multiplying many values which are less than 1 ultimately that will become a very very small number right so let's say all these are 0 0.1 and when you are multiplying 0 0.1 100 times it will become 0 0.1 to the power 100 so it's almost 0 so the gradient here is vanishes and that is why it's called vanishing gradient problem so the first part of the neural network it's not getting any information which is coming at the later part so that means when it was uh, the verb was was so there is a very less chance that it will come down to white worker so the entire network will have a very hard time to remember okay there was a singular noun here so i should remember that the singular noun was there at the start of the sentence and when i'm using the verb here was so i should i mean that memory is almost gone because of this vanishing gradient because it's almost zero so it, it, it's very difficult to remember so this problem is called vanishing gradient problem and uh, we will see how we can solve this problem using gru and lstms but before that the another problem is called exploding gradient problem but it's the other way down so let's say all the values are greater than one instead of less than one let's say two then it will be two to the power hundred right so your uh, the gradients are blowing up and because of that uh, uh, you, it might happen that your entire neural network weight factors get messed up because it's a very huge number and most probably it will you will uh, end up with nans which is uh, not a number so it, it turns out that uh, exploding gradient problem it, it's a little bit easier to handle compared to vanishing gradient problem because when you see that you are finding nans you just clip the value so this is the solution is called gradient clipping if your gradient value goes beyond a certain threshold you just clip it and you just fix it to a certain value so that's how you solve uh, uh, when you, uh, exploding gradient problem i think i have 5 minutes so i'll finish i'll just go through quickly uh, gru so i think all of you maybe all of you have seen despicable me right so this character is called gru and that's what uh, uh, it is a uh, gated recurrent unit so here instead of uh, uh, the standard neural network you don't have these gates so here you introduce a gate called uh, update gate and if you i think it's not too very good uh, very visible here so this update gate is actually helps you to memorize something which has happened at the very early part of your sentence and that you'll be using at the later part so when this value is one it remembers that uh, so this is called memory cell the ct minus 1 and it remembers that i should remember what was happened earlier so say so let's say you have a, a 100 length sequence and at 99th position you you want to remember what happened at the second position so you just just pass the entire value from second position to 99th position making the update gate value to be 1 and then rest of the positions it will be 0 so that's how you remember uh, uh, this lo long term dependencies. So, I, I initially thought I would explain it, but I am running out of time, so I'll just keep it. If you have questions, then you just uh, uh, let me know after the, after this talk. So, that's what I, I mentioned that it should be one when it's white worker. Rest of the part, it will be zero so that it remembers, let's say C23, it remembers what happened at first first position c1 lstm is a little bit uh, as, a, as a variation of uh, a gru where instead of using only one update gate you also consider a forget gate so it makes the model a little bit more uh, uh, flexible and uh, all the models become com complicated but it's more powerful and uh, and there is no uh, widespread consensus about which model you, you should use at what time but mostly nowadays people are using LSTMs, uh, uh, I mean, it's kind of become a de facto standard. Although uh, nowadays when people are trying to build a large systems, then uh, people have tried, uh, try, started using GRUs because it's a little bit more scalable. But the number of parameters in GRU is less compared to LSTMs.
so that's what elastin is and uh, so there are certain things uh, as i mentioned at the start that i wanted to cover what embeddings but uh, because of time constraint i could not so maybe you can uh, ponder upon all this part where uh, you can uh, first see the neural language model which is the early word representation techniques started by bengio then uh, you can see uh, something called word to vec which is used vastly nowadays and uh, it's started by uh, somebody called mikolov in uh, google brain and then nowadays people are also started looking into the biasness in word representation so word debiasing and fairness so these are certain things maybe you can go back and look up okay so so i'll finish with this uh, quote by dave waters which says that a baby learns to crawl walk and then run we are in the crawling stage when it comes to applying machine learning so we have just scratched the surface there are a lot of things that can be done in uh, machine learning and i believe all of you will uh, will will do uh, will work on machine learning and will do some good research on this so this is where i'll stop and uh, so thank you very much thanks